Hey guys, Richard at Fish and Auto Channel and Reef.com. How are you guys doing today? And I am here in Plant City, Florida to visit my good friend Chris Meckley of ACI Aquaculture. Check out what he had to say. Hello, my name is Chris Meckley from ACI Aquaculture. We're going to do a short segment here explaining the reasons why pH stability close to natural seawater is very important for your aquarium. pH, it's something that uh, has been widely known in the aquarium industry that you shouldn't chase your pH. Well, we used to agree with that and I've had basically a low pH in all of our coral systems for the entire time we've been farming corals. And we've had really good success with the health and the growth of the corals that we are propagating. But it's always been a concern of mine that we've never been able to achieve, even in the open air environment that our farm is in, we've never been able to achieve natural seawater pH levels. No matter what we've done, even the systems that didn't have, we, we, we thought it attributed to the calcium reactors because of the carbonic acid that's being produced by injecting CO2 in the reactor to dissolve the media to raise your alkalinity, keep your calcium levels stabilized, and also help with the magnesium levels. But when we found that the system, we have one system in our place that does not have a calcium reactor on it. And we also noticed that it has a fairly low pH consistently. And the pH was bottoming out at about 7.85. Well, natural seawater is like around 8.3. So we tried a bunch of different things to get that pH to stay up and stay stable. And most methods that are on the market um, didn't work for our application. You know, 2,000 gallon systems, 1,500 gallon systems, 2,500 gallon systems. You know, for us to be using the normal methods that most aquarists use, which was basically doing a quackwasser drip, calcium hydroxide, with us, the amount that we needed, it was just we were constantly chasing the pH, or not the pH, the salinity. So we would have to add so much calcium hydroxide in solution that that much fresh water is being added to the system that our salinity would literally drop and continue to drop on a daily basis. And most people have the exact opposite problem where they have evaporation and the pH is, or the salinity is going up because the water is being evaporated. Well, we decided that it wasn't something that was worth for us to do because it would be, it was something we would have to constantly be adding higher top off water with a higher salinity level in it. And that wasn't feasible because there was no real uh, exact amount that was gonna have to be done per system and how much higher the salinity level needed to be. So we scrapped it all, all together and just dealt with the, the low pH. So I've had um, a few people mentioning to me, you know, oh my gosh, I got this uh, method we're doing for keeping the pH up. And most of them are just using, you know, calcium hydroxide, which is Kalkwasser. And um, on a smaller system, if you add a lot of it on a daily basis, it only takes a small water change to actually, of a higher salinity water to get that salinity back to where it needs to be. So we decided we were gonna go even farther and look into another method for pH control and stabilization. And uh, I have a really good friend of mine um, that is back in the industry, and I'm so happy he is because he's got me back into the whole science of water, the chemistry of water, and um, so much to learn. When you think you know, you don't, because there's variables you didn't think about, and that's the beauty of what we do here at ACI and actually every aquarist. Um, so what we've done is we, we've got, uh, my friend um, figured out what max concentration of potassium hydroxide or potash. Um, very, very caustic, very dangerous. I mean, they use it at butcher shops to melt the remaining flesh left on the bones off before the bones go to the processing plant to be used and made in the dog toys. So if that says anything about what we're dosing in our coral systems here at ACI, makes you understand that everything we do is in super tiny baby steps. Might as well call them fetus steps at that point <laughs> because it's very, very dangerous what we're doing to the animals if it's not done 
in a control and actually very, very slowly. I mentioned it a few months ago that we were doing something new with pH and I'm very happy with what we've found as results. Um, well, that whole thing, I can toss it out the window because what we were doing then and what we're doing now is completely different. Um, again, science, science is amazing. There's variables that keep science going. I mean, you can never have all the variables from system to system, ever. It's impossible. There's so many different things that are going on that keeps you on your toes, keeps things interesting, and helps you learn a lot about what scientists have to go through on a daily basis to be considered credible. And my employees, you know, when I first got this stuff, they called me the mad scientist because <laughs> my friend got me so scared of it. I had goggles on, I had a mask on, I had the whole, you know, apron, gloves up to my arms. I was like completely freaked out because at the beginning, he wanted to send it to me in a liquid form already in concentration, max concentration of RO water and dry potassium hydroxide. And you know, I thought about it, I was gonna do it, and I said, you know, I, I, I'm so tired of spending money on water to be shipped to me. Just send me the dry and tell me what to do, and I'm smart enough that I can do it. You know, I'm not gonna take it for granted. I'm not gonna say, ah, you know, he said this, but I'm gonna do this. No, I took him for every word that he said, and I was making sure I was very careful with this stuff because it um, literally melts your flesh. Um, it's such a high alkaline pH and such a small minute amount needs to be put into the systems um, that when I was mixing it to max concentration of RO water, and the way I did it, my, I wish my employees would have videotaped me because they could have put it in this video. It would have been funny to show you, you know, what I looked like with all the goggles and everything because it literally was, um, I was freaking out because I'm like, I can't believe I'm mixing this stuff up. It's pretty bad stuff. But um, I did it and then I realized it's bad, but as long as you do things right, it's not that bad. Um, so when we got it, 2200 gallon system, I needed to raise my pH from 7.85 at nighttime at the valley of the pH swing to a peak of 8.13. And I'm like, that's not natural seawater. I've got all my other parameters in a very good range. Of course, I always keep our alkaline a little bit higher than natural seawater, just in case you know, something were to happen and it doesn't drop way below before we catch the problem. I keep our calcium a little bit higher than natural seawater. Um, I guess uh, 390 for your calcium is natural seawater, 7.6 is the average of the world's oceans in alkalinity. And um, the magnesium is I think 1190, but I like to keep that a little bit higher because I've found really positive results from that. So I said, well, why, why, why can't I keep my pH maybe a little bit higher because everything else is a little bit higher. Why would just having pH be a little bit higher? So with the potassium hydroxide that we're using, uh, in the very beginning, we were using just the potassium hydroxide. And my friend told me, max concentration, one drop every five seconds. And I laughed at him. I'm like, what are you talking about, man? This is 2,200 gallons of water we're talking about here. He's like, Chris, if you're gonna ever listen to me, he's like, you listen to me on mixing it, just listen to me when I say one drop every five seconds and just watch it. So I'm like, okay, you know, listen to the scientist. I did, I'm glad I did. Because one drop every five seconds took my pH. The peak in the day is normally right around two, 2.30, because that's right when some of the lights start cycling off. Once the first set of lights start cycling off, then you can see the pH start to slowly fall from where the peak was. So I started the drip in the morning, and I did get the pH to around 8.35, which I was super excited about. The lights went off, and it started going down. And I'm like, oh, I'm dripping this stuff, one drop every five seconds, why is it going down? But literally one drop every five seconds when the peak was at 8.13 to that small amount going in my system, got it to 8.35, I 
I was blown away. So the next day, you know, I left the drip going, kept it going, and you know, overnight it would stop because of whatever reason, you know, using something that's not a peristolic pump to actually dose, you know, you have a lot of variables in the reason why that drip would stop or slow down the amount of height that has to go to before it starts falling again. So bottom line, if you get a chance to do dosing on your system, do it through a Neptune system, a dose pump, or another type of dosing pump that you can get your hands on, and be very careful doing your math. Make sure you do the math correctly because you can really mess up a system by doing something if you don't get the math right on the amount of dosing that needs to be done, alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, and especially with what we're using. And I, we will not be offering what we're using to anybody because I don't want the liability. Um, by all means, I can explain it to people, but it's on anybody using it whether they have bad <laughs> issues with it. But it's a positive thing if done correctly is what the bottom line with this whole video is. Um, so we ended up having to adjust the dose after multiple days of doing one drop every five seconds to one drop every three seconds. And then we figured that out. That's about one mil per minute because there's about 20 drops per ml. So one mil per minute, once we figured all that out, after a week of testing it by just dripping it in, we decided to, okay, it's time to hook it up to uh, a dose pump. And uh, at that point, the dosing pump could do it at one mil a minute, but I got nervous because this stuff is so bad and so caustic and so alkaline that if something were to happen where the calibration was not correct or anything, and we dosed two mils a minute, the pH would have gone to 10 and I'd have wiped out the entire system. So we decided that we were gonna take this max concentration potassium hydroxide and dilute it with two full gallons of RO water. So it was at one third concentration. And then we did the math and how many mils it took us to dose it to keep it at a certain level. And we started dosing. And then it was like, okay, we're using potassium hydroxide. So we got potassium going in the system. So now where's the potassium levels? We got our pH stabilizing at a higher pH than what it ever was before. And the potassium levels, it's rising, 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 rising. So that was another thing we had to play with. When we finally figured out what we really needed to do, we learned that we needed to be dosing Kalkwasser and we needed to be dosing the potassium hydroxide at the around the lowest point in our pH as it was dropping as and as it was going back up so that we could achieve stability and I'm still not finished with what I'm doing I still am figuring it all out but I can tell you this my pH has in that in one system since I've been doing this and I've been figuring it all out we haven't lost we haven't had a pH value go below 8.23 because that was where the threshold was for the potassium hydroxide dosing to start we haven't gone below 8.23 in over a month okay sorry we had a power outage it went down to 8.17 but as soon as the power came back on it dosed slowly and we got our pH back so it was a very maybe three four hour period of time where it was lower than that but what we've been noticing with the pH being at a valley of 8.23 which is still below natural seawater and the peak because the pH is always is already not super low when the lights came on we noticed that the the peak was getting was right around 8.38 8.4 which is not a bad thing. It's above natural seawater by a little bit, but again, most people run their alkalinity, calcium, and magnesium above natural seawater, so why would pH be an issue when pH is really what I've learned, the driving factor into how every single one of the major water parameters that we test for stay stabilized. It, it blows my mind what I've learned from the last two months Everything I thought I knew about alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, stability, I threw it out the door. Threw it completely out. Why did I throw all that out the door that I thought I knew about alkalinity, calcium, and magnesium? Well, for one, you know, when you're running a calcium reactor on your, on your system that you're working on this little science experiment for say, and you know, the only thing that's different about the system is the pH. Well, my calcium reactor, and I've talked to multiple people in the industry, Julian Sprung, Jake Adams, 
you know, um, I even uh, touched base a little bit with uh, with, with Mike Paletta about uh, the the calcium reactor and the amount of effluent that was going through my reactor per minute. Um, I, I thought it was really strange that my alkalinity um, to stay stabilized at my range that I wanted it to be in, I needed to run literally two liters of water from the system through my calcium reactor per minute, two liters per minute. And I was having a hard time sometimes keeping my alkalinity stabilized at the 8.3, 8.6 range that I like to keep it in. Um, and as soon as I put the, the, the buffer on and we started working with the potassium hydroxide and the calcium hydroxide, all of a sudden my pH was up and my alkalinity went through the roof. It was like 9.6 and I'm going, whoa, what, what's going on here? You know, what, what, what's causing this? And uh, my, my, my calcium uh, went up, my magnesium went well over 1600 and my calcium reactor shut off and it didn't run. My, my apex said, oh, wait, your alkalinity is too high. Shut the pH controller off, which controls the CO2 going into it which then in turn, you know, meant that straight water was running through the calcium reactor. And then it took about a week before that alkalinity came back down to where I have the threshold set for the pH controller to shut off. It went down to, um, I have it set for the threshold where it shuts off the pH controller so it doesn't go above 8.75 on the alkalinity side. So I was like, sweet, okay, we're back down to where we should be. Well, the calcium reactor um, pH controller came on, started shooting the CO2 into it, which a lot of people don't know what happens in a calcium reactor. Calcium reactor creates um, carbonic acid by injecting CO2 into it, which then lowers the pH of that water, which then dissolves the media that's in there, which then the media adds alkalinity calcium. And if you have magnesium media in the reactor, it dissolves that as well and adds magnesium to your water. So it came back on for six hours and then it shut off for three days. In that six hour period of time of that reactor working like it's supposed to with CO2 injection, in six hours, it raised the alkalinity back up to 9.5. And I'm like, something's wrong here. So, okay. So I said, okay, I gotta, I gotta adjust the reactor, the effluent going through the reactor. So I basically adjusted it and I only had a little ball valve to adjust the, the effluent, which if anybody knows how adjusting a ball valve in minor little minute amounts, it's almost impossible. So I've been searching and searching and searching for a good needle valve that was 3 8 inch to fit on my calcium reactor so I can adjust it, you know, really, really small increments. Well, I adjusted it by half with the ball valve. Finally found these uh, needle valves, which were 50 bucks a pop but worth every penny because now I can adjust it a quarter turn, half turn, and it barely adjusts the amount of effluent coming out of the unit. So I cut it in half. It was three days, the, react the pH controller kicked back on, shooting CO2 into the reactor, drops the pH, six hours later shuts off again. Okay, alkalinity was at 9.3, so it only, with all of the, with one liter a minute going through it, it still raised the alkalinity up from the 8.75 to 9.3. Calcium was still right in range and magnesium was still really high. Again, only thing difference, pH. So I cut that in half and I really couldn't adjust it any farther than that until my needle valve came. So I kind of left it alone and it would go on the calcium reactor would turn on for six hours, it would be off for six hours, then it was back on for six hours, then it was off for six hours, and finally, the needle valve came, I adjusted it. I went from dosing, with just being the pH higher, I went from, a, from dosing two liters a minute through my calcium reactor to less than 500 mils per minute coming out of my calcium reactor to take care of a 2,500 or 2,200 gallon system. And it still baffled me as to why. Well, after talking to my friend, he's a marine scientist, he explained it to me in a little bit more detail what's going on and it made perfect sense to me. We, in our aquariums, because we're a water in a box, 
We're in a house in most cases. There's not a huge amount of ventilation, so the CO2 levels determine your pH. The CO2 levels in the air in your home will determine the pH in your aquarium. And there's a couple of ways you can get rid of the CO2 that goes into your aquarium. Um, you're never gonna 100% get away from it, but the air injected into your, into your protein skimmer can be scrubbed with a media. I think, um, I don't remember who makes it. Somebody makes a CO2 scrubbing media that all your air that goes into that protein skimmer can run through the media, which scrubs the CO2 out of it, which then will help keep your pH from falling. Um, and maybe let it go up a little bit higher, but I've heard mixed opinions on whether it even does anything for your aquarium. Some people say, yeah, it worked great. Some people say it didn't do anything for them. So it goes back to um, carbonic acid, okay? Carbonic acid is in your aquarium. It's something that is created in your aquarium, every aquarium, whether you run a, whether you run a calcium reactor or not. Because of CO2 being injected into your, into your aquarium through your protein skimmer, along with every other um, element that's found in the air in your home, or in our case, in an open air space, which is basically the air found in Florida. Um, carbonic acid is the reason for low pH in everybody's aquariums. So how do you neutralize your carbonic acid? And how do you get rid of the carbonic acid that is naturally occurring because of the atmosphere that we're in? Kalkwasser is a hydroxide which breaks apart carbonic acid which allows your pH to rise which is the reason why a lot of you know old school reefers still straight use nothing but kalkwasser it helps raise your your calcium level and breaks apart your carbonic acid that's found in your system which in turn then allows your alkalinity to stay stable and that's what i found out with the pH being more natural seawater level is because there's no carbonic acid in the carbonic acid that is in your water is very minimal it doesn't allow the carbonic acid to break apart what you want in your aquarium you want your hardness your calcium your magnesium to stay stabilized so when you're breaking apart the carbonic acid with the hydroxide ions it gives the actual alkalinity the ability to stay stabilized in your aquarium. So with your pH being up, it can actually save you a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of heartache when it comes down to alkalinity swings, you know, uh, all buffers, not all buffers are created equal. I mean, some people use um, soda ash to buff their aquarium for alkalinity, which is in my mind is ludicrous because that's the final ingredient you use to mix concrete when they're making concrete and eventually in time if you put too much soda ash in your aquarium you build up in your pipes and everywhere else so if you can keep your ph more stabilized at a higher ph closer to natural seawater levels for one you won't have to dose if you are using soda ash you'll be dosing small amounts of it which will in turn not allow it to end up being an issue building up in your aquarium turning your sand into a brick or if you use an alkalinity buffer such as the Two Little Fishes buffer, which is a combination of um, um, uh, soda ash and bicarbonate, and um, I think it's got two of the other ingredients that are found in a real true like stability alkalinity buffer. Um, they're supposed to be uh, sodium tetraborate and sodium um, sulfate are the other two that are the main ingredients which stabilizes an alkalinity buffer to make it not fall out of solution and using that type of buffer when you're getting your ph more stabilized you'll be losing such a small amount of it that it'll be blowing it'll blow your mind for one it'll save you money there and also your corals will just love you for it. I mean, Richard's going to show you some video of uh, some of the amazing polyp extension and the, and the growth. I mean, I'm sure he can go back through videos from when he was here right after COVID kind of happened and saw when we weren't doing anything with our pH and what the corals look like today. Heck, he might even be able to show you something that was small that we weren't able to put on the market that has grown so much that we're on the market selling it. So the growth is, is absolutely amazing. And also the color, because you're getting extra potassium ions in your water with the potassium hydroxide, we are just tickled to death on what results we're getting by the pH being closer to natural seawaters, our potassium levels being a little higher than natural seawaters. The colors, they literally glow. 
everything from greens to reds to blues to purples, yellows. I mean, we have beach bum, Monty. I think it's Montipora cubensis, maybe it's Paloanensis, one of the two, I'm not 100% sure. I've only ever really seen frags of it, so I can't really determine what species it is um, because everything's always in frags. Nobody lets things grow into a colony anymore. Um, but anyhow, um, our beach bum. It was just a brown coral, not growing. And I'm going, why is everybody else having good luck with their beach bums and they look beautiful, that yellow with the blue polyps, the red rim. And now, in a matter of two months of our pH being up, a piece of coral that was as big as my thumbnail is now like this big. And just the most mind-blowing colors, like you see people sending photos out of their beach bums that they're offering up for sale. So stability in pH makes stability in all your other water parameters because the carbonic acid levels in your system are not as present or not in as heavy concentrations and that allows your alkalinity to stay in solution and not be broken apart. That allows your corals to utilize them in the way they were supposed to be utilized. So here we go, a quick recap of what we're doing here at ACI and again this is not for everybody. We're using very, very dangerous, highly caustic alkaline materials potassium hydroxide. Um, I don't recommend it for everybody. Again, we're a commercial outfit and small amounts go a long way. And in a small aquarium, small amounts can be a major, major problem, especially if they're not used properly. If it's something that somebody wants to try in their system, I can help. But I am not taking any responsibility for what is being done with it. I will not sell the product to anybody. Even my friend that is offering this and came up with this idea, We've I've talked about it many a times. We were gonna do a release that needed to be notarized. We want nothing to do with anybody using this product because we don't know how everybody's going to use it, whether they're gonna use it the proper way. And we all know that instructions, especially for men sometimes, aren't something that we listen to or read very, very clearly. So, uh, potassium hydroxide will maintain your pH for you. It'll also boost your, out, your potassium up through the roof. And it's very, very, um, uh, important if it is something you plan on using that you use it in the proper way and you use it very very slowly slow and steady wins the race it will cause problems if you don't use it properly so again bottom line what we've learned just in a short two month period of time growth will go through the roof when you keep your ph more stable your alkalinity will stay more stable your potassium or your your um, magnesium and your calcium will stay more stable uh, you will get mind-blowing colors from your corals. You know, as a coral farm, we love the animals first and foremost, always. But we also have to make sure that it is even something that we can do to sustain our livelihood. And we think that with what we're doing is gonna be a huge benefit for the entire industry because we're gonna be able to put out a product on, or a, 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 a coral fragment on the market that is grown in the best possible conditions that we can put them in. And it's mainly learned just in the past two months that pH is the key to the stability of your system. And uh, when you talk about a coral fragment that's this big, it's an Acropora that in two months period of time has gotten this big and multiple branches. And we've never seen that kind of growth before, as well as LPS corals. I mean, blastomuses are known to be slow growers, we put a Blastomusa back there, one of my favorites that we've ever received. It's been up on our Facebook um, post multiple times, um, just two weeks ago as a matter of fact. And the piece that we saved was cut and fragged at the same time that all the other ones were. And the other systems had no baby growth. I just took a look at it real quickly, two days ago. I couldn't count how many babies were growing around the base of every single one of the polyps where the cuts were made. It blows my mind because we do feed a lot, but the pH is the, the only difference between that system and the other systems where the other fragments of the same exact coral were being kept and we've got major growth on the one that was in the farm system that has a pH that's more stable towards natural seawater levels. So if it's something you want to do, I'd start off with calcium hydroxide or Kalkwasser. It will work. In some cases, because of the type of home you're in or how many people live in your home, 
whether you use a calcium reactor or you don't use a calcium reactor, it's going to determine. There's so many variables, I can't tell you what they all are. It's something you're going to have to figure out on your own. Start by doing everything slowly and achieve the goals that you have for your aquarium and you will achieve an absolutely stunning, the absolutely stunning results that you can get from having a pH that's stabilized it closer to natural seawater levels. So with that being said, my name is Chris Meckley from ACI Aquaculture. I really hope you enjoyed this and I'm out.